<clears throat> I'm going to try to leave time uh, for questions again. <clears throat> A couple of announcements that we'll make here. One of them is uh, this Shabbat. Well, we have a guest speaker, Rico Cortez from Florida. Uh, he has a fantastic ministry. Uh, he, he's fluent in both Spanish and English, and he reaches out to a lot of the Hispanic community. But he's been doing Torah for a long time, and uh, uh, I know him personally. He's a great guy, and I know you guys will really enjoy uh, listening to uh, his ministry. And then we have coming up uh, in a couple of weeks the Purim party right here on Monday night. And then we have David Rubin also coming uh, as well at uh, the end of this month. So also I want to remind you, we got the Passover tickets. Uh, if you haven't got your Seder tickets, of course, you can do it uh, by phone. Call the office and we'll mail you the tickets. You can mail the money or we have them available here every Monday night. And now that it's also available on the Internet, we have people from around the further away that are ordering tickets. We want to make sure you get your tickets while you can. Okay, are you ready? Uh, tonight, what we'll be looking at, and uh, I'll be doing next week as well, we're going to be looking at uh, the festivals, the feasts, and I have here, uh, it's called Times of Rejoicing. We're going to have a lot of fun tonight and look at things from another perspective. Let's start with Bamidbar, or the book of Numbers, chapter 10, verse 9. And here it says, when you go into battle in your land against the adversary, who is distressing you? Any of you, of you have any adversary who distresses you? Then it says you have shouted with the trumpets. And you have been remembered before Jehovah your God. I think this is interesting. It's when you blow the shofar, God remembers. I mean, how many of you want God to remember you? Okay. Well, this is a good idea. It says, and you have been saved from your enemies... And then it says, and in the day of your gladness and in your appointed seasons and in the beginning of your months, you have blown also with trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings. And they've been to you for a memorial before your God. I, Jehovah, am your God. So here we see the feasts are to be the day of your what? Gladness. So let's, I got four PowerPoints I'm going to show you right in a row. Okay, there's the first one. <clears throat> you see everyone rejoicing and what are they holding? Torah scrolls, okay. And here, this is, what, Simchat Torah. And what does that mean? Rejoicing in the Torah. So here I have these people, and they're going, woohoo! They're, they're, they're marching along. Okay. Here's the thing. I got this party, an invitation. Any of you ever got an invitation to a party? I tell you what, God likes parties. Okay, God has sent everyone in the you know, in his family, an invitation. Now, why in the world would someone not want to go to one of God's parties? I mean, that's just craziness. God loves a party. Now, let me ask you this. Why in the world would Christians only want doom and gloom? God has appointed times for us to rejoice in him. I mean, when people say the feasts are all legalism, they're done away with, why are you trying to throw out God's parties? He wants to have a party for heaven's sake with you guys. The time with his kids to have fun and rejoice in him. To me, that just doesn't make sense. Look at Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 14 through 17. <clears throat> it says, sing, O daughter of Zion. And what else? Shout. The, the Hebrew word for shout is teruah. Okay. Uh, like Yom Teruah, the, the day of blowing the Feast of Trumpets, sometimes uh, trumpets, blowing, teruah, shouting, it's all the same word. It says, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your judgments. He's cast out your enemy. The King of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of you. You shall not see evil anymore. And that day it will be said to Jerusalem, fear thou not, and to Zion let not your hands be slack. Now look at this. Everyone's familiar with this next verse. The Lord your God in the midst of you is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over you with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over you with singing. Do you like that? What do you think if someone says, nope, can't do it. That's legalism. <laughs> what? The, the whole purpose of the festivals is God joying over you with singing and you rejoicing that he's there with you. 
it just can't, I just don't understand why Christians want to throw it out and say it's all legalism. A lot of it, I think, is anti-Semitic in some sense. Now, let me give you an idea of some of the titles of God's appointed times. I'll put up this next clip here. Okay. Yom is what? Day. Remember Simchat Torah? And what is Simchat rejoicing? You have Simchat Chem, which is from Numbers 10.10, the day of your joy. You have the word uh, Moed, which means your divine appointment, as in Leviticus 23.2. And you have uh, a word. Now, it's not hog, as in a hog. It's hog. Okay? Hog. Okay, the C-H, the chet. Okay, but what's interesting about this <clears throat> is this, in, and I have on your notes here where it talks about these are times of great joy, God is with us, and we're with each other, everyone comes together. The word moed you see on your notes is appointed time, it's also translated as feast. And this here's Leviticus 23.2. This is where it says, speak to the children of Israel, say unto them concerning the feasts. Now here it's in the plural, Moadim, of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. Even these are my feasts. Okay. So the Hebrew word Moed, I think the word feast is really a, a wrong translation. Because when we hear the word feast, we think of food. But what this is saying is these are fixed time. Now, if there's a fixed time, does that mean it's movable? It's not movable. And whose calendar is this? God's or ours? This is God's. God says, look, guys, here's my calendar. These are fixed dates. They're not to be changed or moved. And mark them well. And so then I want you to notice in Deuteronomy 16, 16. Here's where it says, three times in a year shall all your males appear before the Lord your God in the place which he shall choose in the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But I want you to notice it's not the Hebrew word moed here. It's the other word. And then it says, and in the Feast of Weeks, which, is, which holiday is the Feast of Weeks? That's Shavuot or Pentecost. And then in the Feast of Tabernacles, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty. And so the, the root word is Strong's number 22.7, Chagag. And I want you to notice that what, it, what does it mean? It means to do what? to move in a straight line. No, it means to move where? In a circle. To march in a sacred procession. To observe a festival. By implication, to be giddy, to celebrate, to dance. So these three festivals in Deuteronomy 16, 16, God says, okay, in these three festivals, we are going to party. We're gonna have fun, we're gonna be giddy, we're gonna dance, we're gonna rejoice on the Feast of Passover, Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Shavuot or Pentecost, and then also on the Feast of Tabernacles because God is with us. And so God is saying, hey guys, let's have some fun. Now, these were called pilgrimage feasts. Why were they called pilgrimage feasts? Three times a year, all the males had to go to Jerusalem to be there. Okay, every year, how often did they have to do that? It's not a matter of, okay, once done that, checklist, don't need to do it again for another thousand years. They were to do it how often? Every year. Let's take a look at this next clip. Okay. What, are, what is this thing doing? It's moving in a... If it's not moving in a circle, you're not going anywhere. Okay? God wants us... Is this is the idea of a feast, is to move in a circle, go round and round. Let's take a look at this. <clears throat> okay, so winter, spring, summer, fall, it go, does it, once you have winter, you never have again the rest of your life? It's a circle, winter, spring, summer, fall, winter, spring, summer, fall, going round and round in a circle. In other words, history is gonna repeat itself. And God, how many of you know, how many of you have learned everything you could know the first time you read it? That's why God wants us to go over and over and over these things, okay? And so I even have this thing looking like a wheel, and what's right in the center of the wheel? That is the first appointed time that God gave his people in Leviticus 23, 1 through 4. Let's look at what it says. 
It says, The Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say unto them, Concerning the Moedim of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. So who do the feasts belong to? They belong to God. He says, Six days will work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest. It's a holy convocation. Don't do any work. It's the Sabbath of the Jews. No, the Sabbath of Israel. Well, it's the Sabbath of the Lord. In all your dwellings, these are the feasts of the Lord. Even holy convocations you shall proclaim in their seasons. Now, we're going to talk more about uh, the Sabbath probably next week. But let's look at this clip here again. I want to show you this, this circle where everything is going around. And so what did God give us? Okay, the Passover. And then what comes after Passover? You have unleavened bread. And then what comes after unleavened bread? You have the first fruits of the barley harvest. And then what? Okay, then you have the counting of the Omer, which leads us to the next festival, Shavuot. Okay, which leads us to the fall feast where you have the Feast of Trumpets, followed by the Feast of Yom Kippur, followed by the Feast of Sukkot. This is a cycle going round and round, okay? And then there are two biblical feasts that weren't appointed times, but it's interesting. I believe they will become appointed times, probably in the millennial reign, but you have Hanukkah and you have Purim, which is coming up. And we're gonna be talking about those and the messianic implications that they have. But my goodness, I mean, God has all these times when we can get together and rejoice, and Hanukkah and Purim really is celebrating the Jews' survival. Now, that's something to rejoice about. Many of you are familiar with Romans 12. It says, rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Okay, so that's why I think it's a good idea to rejoice on Hanukkah, to rejoice on Purim, and then also to weep on the ninth of Av, you know, Tammuz 17. Tibet 10, you know, fast, and uh, we need to do that. But what I want you to notice is God has this circular thing going because he knows we don't get it the first time. Especially if, if you were to adopt, let's say, a child from another country, you bring them to America, okay, they're used to all their own holidays, but now you want to get them to use the American holidays, and they're not going to get the full knowledge of all these holidays doing it once. Well, usually with God's holidays, he knows it's not until you really do it. Studying it is one thing. Clear back in 1977 is when I studied the feast. That's when I was introduced to the feast, back in 1977. <clears throat> but it was from a replacement theology perspective. I love studying it and all the implications, but it wasn't until I started doing the feasts about 20 years later in 93 that, what? Oh, could you put the picture back up? They want to look at the picture to write it down. If you could put the picture back up for me. <clears throat> so um, anyway, what, with anything, I, I, you know, I'm not mechanical. And so I can read how to put a bicycle together. But that, I can read it till I have it memorized. But until I actually put it together, you know, I don't really know how to put it together. And sometimes I have to take it back apart and re-put it back together. Because I didn't do it right. So, some of you know what I'm talking about. I'm mechanically challenged. But what we're going to look at first is Passover, and then the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is connected to it. Okay, so let's start with Exodus chapter 12, verse 17. It says, you are to observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread... It says, because it was in this very day, the selfsame day that I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt, therefore you shall observe this day in your generations by an ordinance for how long? In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, that even you're to eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at even. Okay, are you guys done with this? Because I'm going to go to the next picture if you're done. If you're not done, okay, here we go. All right, what are we looking at there? Matzah. Okay. And so, <clears throat> Exodus uh, twelve seventeen. I just got done reading. And what does pa uh, Passover commemorate? It commemorates the death of the firstborn and trusting in the blood of the lamb that was put on their doorpost. 
while the seven-day feast of unleavened bread commemorates the exodus from Egypt. Now, this is important to know. Sometimes the entire week is called Passover week. And sometimes it's just the whole time is called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, what I want to do is tell you about some parallels between these feasts and the work of the Messiah. Okay, they were freed from where? Egypt, what were they in? Slavery. So what do you think that represents? Our freedom from what? The slavery to the world and to sin. Now look at 2 Timothy. If we take a look at chapter 2 and verse 25 and 26. It says, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. I always thought that's an interesting verse. Here you have people who are in opposition to their very self. I mean, think about it. Every time we sin, we're in opposition to ourselves. But it says, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledgement of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Can you imagine? Now, how many of you know, uh, before you're redeemed, when you're still in the world, all the devil has to do is just stir one emotion, show you one clip, one billboard, whatever, and your habit, you're hooked. Your hook, line, and sinker. I mean, that's, he, he's got gotcha. you. Well, look at Romans 6, 6. It says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So here's the problem. They were slaves in Egypt, but God says, I don't want you to be a slave in Egypt anymore. I want you to serve me. But he, we have to kill that body of sin, that it would be destroyed. Now, some of you have heard this before, but those of you who have not heard this, did you know, through much study and archaeology and different things, they found out who the good thief on the cross was. It was the Apostle Paul's dad. He said, my old man was crucified with Christ. Ah, I'm just kidding. <clears throat> okay, moving on. <clears throat> now, I th what I think is interesting, the Feast of Unleavened Bread symbolized what? I just got it saying a little bit ago. See if you were listening. The Exodus. It's the exodus from Egypt. And I think it's interesting that it's seven days long. What is that kind of telling us sometimes? Sometimes exiting Egypt takes time. Okay, they had to leave in haste, which is something else we'll talk about here in a little bit. But uh, how many of you know it, it takes, uh, sometimes it takes a little while to get freed from the, the world? How many of us sometimes after we've been freed still have some baggage hanging that we've got to get rid of? Well, the other thing that we're going to look at is the menu. So let's put up the menu on this next PowerPoint. Uh, at a Passover Seder, they have a lot of different things, not everything that's mentioned in this verse. But let's take a look at this verse first to see what's definitely on the menu from a biblical standpoint in Exodus 12, 5 through 8. It says, your lamb. So we see they had lamb. It's to be without blemish. It's to be a male of the first year. And it says you're to take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And you're to keep it till the 14th day of the same month. Now, what day did they take it? The 10th. They would hold it for four days. And then it says, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And then they shall take of the blood, strike it on the two side posts, on the upper door posts of the house, wherein they'll eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roasted with fire. But what else are they supposed to eat with the lamb? Unleavened bread and what else? Bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Now let me ask you something. Who here has not ever been to a Passover Seder? Do we have anyone here who's never been to a Passover Seder? Okay, you guys would love our Passover Seder if you can make it. Our Seder is different than a lot of the other Passover Seders that you might go to, believe me. I've been to a lot of different kinds and ours is different. But uh, it's very educational and we highly recommend you come to it. And one of the things we find, the lamb had to be roasted how? Whole. 
And uh, one of the reasons why, and some of you may not be aware of this, but see, they couldn't cut the lamb up and roast it as different parts. The reason why was because the lamb was a god that the Egyptians worshipped. And in the spring, around, you know, March, April, whenever it would be, this is when the constellation Aries, which is the ram, or the lamb is really big, and Passover is at the full moon, which is the middle of the month when the moon is full, when the Egyptians thought their lamb god was at the apex of his power. And so God says, I want you to take that lamb that they're worshiping, and I want you to kill it, okay? And how many of you like summer barbecues and you can smell the neighbor with barbecuing and all this, oh, it tastes great? Well, believe me, you've got several hundred thousand lambs being roasted. Who's smelling this? All the Egyptians, they're smelling, hey, they just killed our God. And then what are they doing? Then they're taking the blood and putting it not on the inside of the house, on the outside of the house so they know which house killed their God. Okay? And they're saying, look, paganism stops at my door. We're not going to have any of this. Okay, well, when they were to roast the lamb, they couldn't pass it off as something else. They, they, God wanted every Egyptian to know that they're roasting the lamb whole and entire. <clears throat> well, what do the, uh, the bitter herbs remind them of slavery? Okay, for us, it's the bitterness and the slavery of sin. Now, if you'll notice here, I have the bitter herbs and the matzah, uh, but I want to start up here with the parsley, which is kind of like the bitter herbs. Uh, it represented the hyssop, they say, that was dipped in tears or also in the basin of blood that was put on the doorpost. The matzah, the sinless Messiah, it's our source of life. The bitter herbs represents Yeshua's bitter experience as well as our bitter experience with sin. Uh, the shank bone represents the lamb that was sacrificed on our behalf. Uh, the roasted egg represents the temple's destruction twice on the same day, Tishbi off or the ninth of Av. And then the Kharoset that is at a Seder uh, represents the mortar to build the pyramids, also the sweetness of our deliverance. Now here's the other interesting thing. How many of you understand the concept of the bitterness of sin? You know what I'm talking about? Well, we're going to take a look at it another way. Look at Hebrews 11.25. Here it talks about Moses who chose whether to suffer affliction with the people of God than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. So does that mean sin is bitter or is it pleasurable? What, what is it really talking about here? Well, look at Ecclesiastes 8 verse 11. It says, because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. If you were to sin and immediately drop dead, I'll bet you people would stop that one right away. <laughs> We're going to pick a different sin. Okay, boy, God's serious about this one. You are dead immediately, all right? And so, but the problem with sin is it's pleasurable. It's not bitter. What's bitter, what is, what is bitter about it? I mean, the Bible says it's pleasurable, but the problem is it's that aftertaste. It, it's, it's the consequences. and It's the thing that follows it. And I think that's the, the problem that we have is sometimes we see sin as just, uh, it's all about me. That's really what sin is. It's all about me. It's not about God. I think that people <clears throat> sin because they really don't care about the relationship with God. They're, they are more important than what God thinks. Yeah, it's just, it's just self-centeredness. Okay, I know God that you don't want to do that. I mean, think of it in terms of relationship uh, between a married couple or parent and child, however you want to look at it. If I knew that my, I mean, uh, Rich Del Pryor and I were talking about this earlier too. If, would it, is it sweet if I bought my wife roses? But what if she's allergic to roses? All of a sudden it's not sweet anymore. If I gave her some Reese's peanut butter chocolate, that might be good, but what if she's allergic to peanut butter? That's not so good. Okay, well, the thing is this, if, if I know that my wife doesn't want something, if I go ahead and I do it, what she doesn't want, is that loving? That's not loving at all. And if, and if I know she doesn't like something, then I'm really not going to do that. So when God tells us, hey, here's things I really don't like, guys. 
and here's things I really do like, and we ignore both, what is that really telling God? We really don't care about the relationship. I, I think the problem is we love our sin too much. We say, God, I mean, how many of us want to be saved from our sins? Okay, isn't that what he came to do? He came to save us from our sins. The problem is we don't want to be saved from our sins. We want to be saved from the consequences of our sins. God, don't save me from my sin. I love it too much. Just save me from the consequence and let me keep sinning. And that is really what's going on. People don't want to be saved from their sin. God, let me keep my sin. Just save me from the consequence. And they think once they said the magic words that are in, now they can sin all they want. What kind of, what, what kind of a relationship do you have with someone if, if that is the, the motivation? That's horrible. Let's look at the matzah, okay? The matzah, they had to have a hasty departure, didn't they? They had to hurry up, and this was a teaching, I forgot where I heard it the other day. I listened to so many different things, read so many different things. But remember, they had to make matzah because they had to hurry and get out of there, right? But God said, hey, you got plenty of time, though, to go plunder the Egyptians first. Well, wait a minute, I thought they were in a hurry. God said, hey, you take your time, go get everything you can get, plunder the Egyptians, and then we'll hurry up and get the heck out of here. <laughs> you know, then it's run for your life, head for the hills. You know, think of Lot's wife, right? And Lot, I mean, the whole story, Lot wasn't in a hurry to get out of there. God said, you need to get out of there. But he has hesitated, you know, and Lot's wife even looked back. I've got a whole teaching on the armor of God in Ephesians. I think a lot of people misunderstand the, the whole concept of the armor of God and they see it as some stupid Roman soldier's uniform. It has nothing to do with that. But that's a whole other teaching. But how many of you know sometimes we're in a battle? And how many of you sometimes you want to you fight the devil, right? You want to go after him. I mean, after all, the Bible says he'll flee from you. It's only people who are afraid of the devil. No, he's supposed to run from you, but only when you submit yourself to God. Okay, then he'll start fleeing from you. But there are some battles that we're not to fight. I mean, sometimes, how often in our mind do we think, hmm, I'm going to see how close I can get without sinning. I'm going to enjoy, I want to enjoy this particular thing, but I'm not going to blow it at the end. I'm just going to see how close I can get. And then at the last minute, you end up blowing it anyway, and you go, oh, doggone it, now I've got to start all over again. But there's one battle that God says, don't try this one, guys. Run for your life. And it's flee fornication. That's a battle that you're not supposed to fight. You're supposed to run for your life. Okay? There's some, there's some things God says, just run. Look at 1 Corinthians 5, 7 and 8. It says, to purge out the old leaven that you may be what? A new lump. How many of you ever heard of starter dough where you take a little bit of dough from the old one and you start, and so it's got the old leaven in it, right? But at Passover, it's okay, start over. Everything's gone. You're going to start with a new lump, okay? And so that's very important to realize. It says you are a new lump as you are what? Unleavened. That means you're to be matzah. You are matzah. You are to be unleavened bread. And I have a whole teaching on that that we began this series with several months ago. Well, we need to realize you are to be unleavened. You're not to be leavened that is forgiven. You're to be a new lump. You're not to be, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. No, you're not to be a sinner saved by grace. You're to be a saint who is saved by grace. A saint who's been saved by grace. That's why people are defeated in their walk. They see themselves as just sinners saved by grace rather than a saint saved by grace. You're a new lump. You're not some old leavened lump that's saved. You're to be a new lump of unleavened bread. But I think this is why a lot of people aren't successful in their walk. It's because of their identity. If someone tells you you're stupid all your life, oh, stupid is, stupid does, <laughs> you know, and then, oh, I'm just a sinner, saved by grace, so I can't help but sin. No, you're supposed to be an overcomer. 
And it's when you realize you're a new lump. Okay. Sin isn't to be a part of our new nature. Now, it's not that we're not going to sin, but it's not part of, you're not taken captive by Satan's will anymore. You're, you've been set free. Now, it, it's going to be something that's abnormal, not the normal course. So let's look at Passover. Exodus 6, 6 through 8. It says, Wherefore, say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rid you out of their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments, and I will take you to me for a people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. I'm the one who brought you out from under the burden of the Egyptians, and what else? I will bring you into the land concerning the which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you for a heritage. I am the Lord. Man, God said he's going to do a lot of things, didn't he? Now, what's the difference between a heritage and an inheritance? An inheritance, when you get it, if you want to sell it, you can sell it, do whatever you want. You can't do that with a heritage. Okay, so the land is a heritage that can't be bought and sold. This is why Solomon was so wrong when he went and gave some of the land from the Galilee to the king Hiram of Tyre, and he ended up not wanting it. Oh, it's, isn't that today what's going on? They try to give them land and they don't want it. Okay. But anyway, what I want to show you now, in the next four clips, we'll start with the next one that comes up. Okay, this, at a Passover Seder, and many Christians aren't aware of this, when Yeshua lifted up the cup, they think there was just one cup. There was actually four cups. And even in Luke, it mentions about the cup after supper. There was a cup before, there's a cup after. At the Passover Seder, I go over all four cups, and we're just going to give a quick review here. But the first cup is based on this first I will, where God says, I'm going to bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. This is called the cup of sanctification. In other words, God chose Israel, and he says, okay, I pick you. Believe me, Egypt was the world power back then, weren't they? There were a lot of other nations who had people there, but God didn't pick those other nations. He says, okay, Israel, you're the nation I'm going to pick. Now, any of you of the other nations, you can come too, but Israel's the nation I'm picking. And if you want to get out, you don't come with your nation, you come with my nation that I'm picking. Okay, so everyone was welcome to come. This is called the cup of sanctification. So the others could leave, but only by entering into the Jewish family group. And what this represents, he says, I am going to bring you out from under the burden. So imagine someone, they've got this heavy load that they're carrying. So God takes the burden off, just like us with the burden of sin. God takes the burden of the sin, that we, the weight of the guilt, and the shame that we've been carrying, he takes it off. But what's the problem? We still are chained to Egypt. So the next level of the redemption process is called the cup of deliverance. And so what does God do next? The next phrase in Exodus 6, 6 is, and guess what? After I've taken the burdens off of you, then I'm going to rescue you from their bondage. So the cup of deliverance is where God says, I'm going to break those chains. Now, in our walk, that is those habits. There are some habits that just fall apart, they, that God just breaks. Sometimes there seems to be other habits that just hang on, too, though. You know, for me, believe it or not, one of the habits that I had, you think I was part bird. Most of my language was foul. <laughs> but, I mean, every other word was a cuss word. I mean, that was just me. But when I got saved, it just, boom, that just quit. That was just one of those things that just stopped dead in its tracks. But that's what God wants to do. He wants to break the chains that are holding you into Egypt. Okay, so that's what he wants to do. And here's the thing. How many masters can you serve? You can only serve what? You can't serve two masters. So God had to unload their burden and break their chains so that Israel could serve him because they can't serve two masters. 
And so what do we see in Exodus 7, 16? God tells Moses, you go to Pharaoh, and here's what I want you to say to him. The Lord God of the Hebrews has sent me to you, saying, let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. But indeed, until now, you would not hear. Well, you know what's interesting about this verse? I don't know if you ever thought about it. How come God said to Pharaoh, let my people go? Why didn't he just go grab them and take them? Why did he need Pharaoh to let go? Think about that. He, he didn't say, I am God, I'm coming and I'm grabbing them and I'm stealing them away from you. He said, Pharaoh, you have to let him go. God puts the squeeze on his neck until he says, uncle, okay. But the problem is we've willingly sold ourselves to him, to the Satan. We are legally bound to Satan, okay? And Satan has to let go. And there also is a price that has to be paid. <clears throat> uh, first off, considering deliverance, there was no way that they could accomplish this on their own. Was there any way Israel could have thrown off their burden themselves and broke their chains themselves? Absolutely no way. It took a miracle. Even at the Red Sea, it took a miracle. And I think this is what happened in our lives. It takes a miracle. God has to intervene. If God does not intervene in our lives, we're a hurting unit. There, there is no hope. And so the next cup is the cup of redemption. So let's take a look at the next cup. Here's where he says, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. This is the third cup. Now think about this. Let's go back again from the practical standpoint. Here they are, they're in Egypt. Okay, God takes their load off. He breaks their chains. But what's the problem? They're still in Egypt. And oftentimes, this is what happens in the Christian walk. God removes the burden, he breaks the chains, but we don't leave. We stay in the world. We hang out with old friends. We hang out with other things. We don't, we don't get the heck out of there. We don't flee. We don't run for the, our lives. But also, a price has to be paid. And this is important. How many of you know that the, it says in Psalms 49, no man, you know, can redeem another person uh, because it's, the soul is precious. It ceases forever. There is no price, which is a whole nother heavy, heavy concept that I, I don't know if I have time, but I'll, it's such a heavy concept. When you think about the world, all the gold, all the silver, all the precious metals, the platinum, and everything in it, how much this world is worth, I mean... More than billions, trillions, gazillions. I mean, this world is worth, I mean, look at all the wars that are fought over the resources here. If you were to count every single house in the whole world and you were to count all the land in the whole world. Now, when God created this world, how much did it cost him to create this world with all the precious metals? What did he do? He just said, be there. <laughs> Boom, it was there. If God were to destroy this entire planet and everything on it, what would it cost him to rebuild another one just like it? He would just say, you know, let it happen. And it would be there. Now, we put a lot of value and work our tails off to get a little piece of dirt, don't we, here? But think about this. What did your redemption cost? Your redemption cost him everything. It cost the father his son. It cost Yeshua his life. And what does that tell you? You are of much more value than all of the resources, the gold and silver on this planet. God values you so much more than all of the minerals and everything on this planet, which is why we need to love people and use things, not love things and use people. You guys need to realize how valuable you are. I don't know if you realize how valuable you are. Any one of you are more valuable than all the resources on this planet to God. Okay, so they were helpless. They had to be redeemed. A price had to be paid. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. It says, for you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Okay, so you've been bought. God had to redeem you. He, so now who do you belong to? Him. Okay, so who are you supposed to please? If you're the servant and he's the master, you're supposed to do what he wants. Which goes back to Luke 17. I mean, so many people are familiar with that one verse. 
Well, if you have faith like a grain of the mustard seed, you'd be able to say to the sycamine tree, be uprooted and cast in the seed, it would obey you, right? And then you got all this prosperity doctrine about faith as a mustard seed. And they totally missed the whole concept of how to increase your faith. This is Luke 17. The disciples come to him and they say, Lord, increase our faith. And then he tells them that parable about the mustard seed. But he did not answer their question there. What, you know what, actually, you know what he was saying? He said this. They said to him, increase our faith. And he said, I don't need to. That's really what he was saying. Romans 12 says he has given unto every man the measure of faith. So everyone has a measure of faith. What good does it do? He's saying, you don't need to increase it. You need to know how to use what you got. You only need a little bit, a mustard seed, and you could do that. So the problem is they don't know how to operate it. How many of you hate computers because you don't know how to operate them? <laughs> and, and it's like you're going to God, God, increase my RAM. <laughs> and God says, increase your RAM. You need to learn how to use what you got. <laughs> and that's our problem with our Christian walk. We keep saying, God, increase our faith. And he's saying, no, learn how to use the little bit you got. Uh, when you go to the gym and you exercise... Uh, isn't that how you, how do you build your muscles? By what? And so what did God tell them? You want to increase your faith, what you need to do is start using what you have and you're going to just naturally build it. So everyone in this prosperity doctrine stopped there, but they don't read the next four verses that says, which of you by and by when your servant has come in the field will say unto him, sit down and eat and not rather say, hey, gird yourself and serve me until after I've eaten and then you can eat and drink. That is the message of how to increase your faith. It's by being a love slave. Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13. Faith, open love, but the greatest of these is what? Love. Why is that? Because Galatians 5 says your faith operates through love. So how do you operate your faith? How do you get it operating? It's by being a love servant. But we don't want to do that. But that's a whole separate subject. So let's get back. Then the, the next cup of the four cups is the cup of acceptance. And this is where God says, you're accepted into my family, okay? In Exodus 6, 6 to 8, he says, I'm gonna take you to me for a people and I will be to you a God. Now think about this. How many of you have heard of the Dayenu? Some of you haven't. It's a, it's a song that's basically sung every Passover. Seder basically means it would have been enough. They said, hey, it would have been enough if you'd just taken off our burden, so to speak. It would have been enough if you'd have just freed us from Egypt. It would have you know, been enough if, you know, whatever. It, it would have been enough. Can you imagine? I mean, it's awfully... Uh, how many of you ever been stranded in your car and you needed gas or a flat tire? Okay, and you have someone come along, they're your hero, and they fill your, gas, uh, your car up with gas, or they fix your tire. Okay, but does that mean they want to marry you? No. Okay, well, look at God. God not only took off their burdens, He not only broke their chains, He not only paid their price, He not only brought them out of Egypt, He said, now I want to marry you. I want to be your bride. I mean, now that is love. And that's what God is saying. He wants to do more than just free you from your sin. He wants a relationship with you. And then lastly, which isn't part of the four cups or part of the Seder, but I think is so important, and that is the land covenant, where he says, I'm going to bring you in. See, if you remember, in the Torah, it always says, I brought, they always say, you brought us out to do what? Kill us. Kill us. And God says, no, I didn't bring you out to kill you. I brought you out to bring you in. I've got some land I want to give you for a heritage. And so then we have, so all of that was just Passover, just a real quick overview. And then that brings us to the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And you can see why we're going to have to go a couple of Monday nights to hit all seven of the feasts. But the unleavened bread uh, represents a Messiah's body who was without sin and would not decay. That's why he was unleavened. And then we have what's called the feast of uh, the barley, the first fruits of the barley harvest. And they were to bring a sheaf. We see in Leviticus 23, verse 10 through 12. It says, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, 
When you come into the land which I give to you and you reap its harvest, you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be what? Accepted on your behalf. And it's to be done on the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And you shall offer on that day when you wave the sheaf, a male lamb of the first year without blemish as a burnt offering to the Lord. Now, I think what's interesting, it says a sheaf. Now, what's the Hebrew word for sheaf there? Come on, you know it. Omer. <laughs> now, not Homer as in Homer Simpson. It's Omer. You're to bring an Omer, a sheaf. Well, what's interesting is a sheaf can represent an individual. We see that in Genesis 37, 7. Concerning Joseph, here he had a dream. He said, for behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose. I think it's interesting when you think of Yeshua as the sheaf, and what did he do? He arose and stood upright. And he says, behold, your sheaf stood round about, and you made obeisance to my sheaf. Now let's look at Leviticus uh, 23, 14. It says, you're not to eat uh, bread nor parched grain nor fresh grain until the same day that you brought an offering to your God. It'll be a statute forever throughout your generations, where? In all of your dwellings. Okay, let me put this next picture up. Let's think about this for a minute. You know, all this stuff, these feasts are to be a statute forever in all your dwellings. Think about this. Everybody gets together and talks about how wonderful God is for redeeming us, his unconditional love, making us into new creations and taking us to himself. Now, doesn't that sound like a reason to party? Okay, and yet someone might say, oh, that's all legalism. We don't want to get together and talk about how wonderful God is for redeeming us or his unconditional love or making us into new creation. That's Jewish. Oh, that's a pretty good Jewish thing to do. And then what do we find in Leviticus 23, verse 15 through 17? It's counting the omer, or make the omer count. It says, and you shall do what? Count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheep of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. Now, it's interesting, how many of you, when you were in grade school, counted the days till summer? How many? I mean, you would count only this many days left or count until when grandma would come or when you're going on a vacation. The whole concept of counting is to bring excitement. Now, the interesting thing is when we count, generally we count down 10, 9, 8, 7. With the Omer, you count up. One, two, three. You're counting up, not down. There's a whole other teaching I have on that. <clears throat> but it says that you are to count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you are to offer a new grain offering to the Lord. You'll bring from your dwellings two wave loaves of two tenths of an ephah. They should be of fine flour, and they are to be baked with what? Leaven. Leaven. They are the first fruits of the Lord. So this brings us to Shabbat or Pentecost, uh, or the Feast of Weeks. And here there's two wave loaves, and they are leavened. Okay, so here at Passover, unleavened bread, you can only eat unleavened bread. But now he says to have leavened bread. Well, I, I could be wrong, but I think these two wave loaves represent the Jew and the non-Jew coming together. And how many of you know we still have a little bit of leaven in us? <laughs> okay. But what this does, this leads us to Shavuot or Pentecost. And what happened at the first Pentecost? What was given to Israel? The Torah. So what this does, this counting of the Omer is a connection from Passover to Pentecost or from Passover to Shabbat, from being redeemed to being given the Torah. They're connected. So for someone to say, I'm redeemed and I don't need the Torah, you severed your connection. The whole idea of counting is to realize that the Torah and redemption go together. So that brings us to Shabbat or the Feast of Weeks. And in Numbers 28, 26 is where we see it's called the Feast of Weeks. It says, also on the day of the first fruits, when you bring a new grain offering to the Lord at your Feast of Weeks. You know, I've talked to Christians who didn't know the Jews had kept Pentecost for 1,500 years before Pentecost. And there's pastors, even, that think Pentecost began in the book of Acts. 
The Jews were commanded to keep it for 1,500 years before Pentecost. And what's amazing, I don't know how many of you are one. I mean, uh, I was, is, whatever, a Pentecostal. But most Pentecostals today never keep Pentecost. And the Jews still do. They were the first Pentecostals. Exodus 23, 16, it talks about the Feast of Harvest. This is referring to Shavuot or Pentecost. And what do we know in Acts? There was 3,000 and then 5,000 and tens of thousands. This was the symbolic of the harvest. This is why Shavuot was known as the Feast of Harvest. This great harvest that would come during the time of Messiah. And do you know what the, what's amazing? The Jews, to this day, the ones who do keep Shavuot, <clears throat> they like to stay up all night studying Torah, studying God's Word. They'll read Exodus 19 about the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai. They'll read from the book of Ezekiel about fire and folding itself and all of this. And the reading in Ezekiel, uh, Exodus about thunder and lightning and voices. And then they also read the book of Ruth. And what's the book of Ruth about? A non-Jew being grafted into Israel. Okay? And many of you know the book of Ruth, it says it took place from the barley harvest to the wheat harvest. Passover to Pentecost. This is the whole setting and the harvest. And what does Ruth mean in Hebrew? Friend. Friend. Do you remember the other lady? Okay, you have Elimelech, my father the king. You have Naomi. They have two sons, Malon and Chilion. Do you remember Malon and Chilion uh, got sick and died? Do you know what their names mean in Hebrew? Weakly and sickly. Okay, so weakly and sickly got weak and sick and they died. Okay, and then what happens? Okay, you have Ruth, which means friend, and who, what was the other lady's name? It's not Oprah, Orpah, okay. Orpa means to turn the back of the neck. So what do you see? Ruth befriends Israel, works to harvest, and brings in the Messiah through King David. Orpah turns her back on Israel and goes back to her pagan gods. And I believe this is prophetic of these last days in the church because Orpah and Ruth represent the Gentile church grafted into Israel. The dividing line is, are, going, are you going to befriend Israel, work the harvest and bring the Messiah? Or are you gonna reject Israel, turn your back on it and go back to the one world church? This is what's quite interesting. It's a whole other teaching I have, but we'll stop here. But I just wanted to kind of touch base with you on some of these things so you can see the significance of all of this. Why we want to keep the festivals. Why you want to, because God is trying to communicate something to us. Round and round we go. Okay, uh, we have time for like two or three questions. Does anyone have a question? Okay, I see that hand, is there another? Mark, I was reading Exodus uh, when God called Aaron and Moses over and they started doing the calendar. And I, I was wondering, because it, it's the prerequisite for the Messiah, literally, did Moses have any idea what he was really doing, do you think? What, what do you think on that? Well, I, I don't know, but I think Moses probably knew a whole lot because he talked to God face to face. We threw a glass, see through a glass darkly. He, he did, I'm sure God, how, to what extent we'll have to ask Moses when we get there. Robin, oh, right there. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, um, when you're talking about this, that the unleavened bread on Passover, do, they, do we keep the unleavened until Pentecost? It was just for that week you would eat unleavened bread. So you could have leaven after the week. Yeah, right. And you can eat unleavened bread year round for that matter, but you had to have unleavened bread only for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Yes? It says that three times a year the males have to go up and appear before the Lord. Does that mean that the women couldn't? Okay, great question. I love this question. Deuteronomy 16, 16 says three times all your males were to appear before the Lord. Now, you, you women are going to love this. Do you know most of the commandments are for the men? And it, how many, in your typical church, how many women come to church versus how many men? 
It's almost all women. Women like to party. God didn't have to command them. They would have naturally done it. God has to tell the dingbat men, will you please go? That's why. It was up to the men, they'd never go. So God had to command the men. He knew the women would come anyway. So of course they would come. They would all come. You bet. Now, uh, seven to- the seventh year, everyone was commanded to come. Men, women, children. Everyone was commanded the seventh year. Okay. But the other years, shoot, the women and kids, you think the kids going to want to not go to a party and see all their friends from Iran, all these other countries all coming together? Oh, man. Oh, yeah, of course, the women would come naturally. He had to command the men. Um. I have a question on the unleavened bread, too. That the one part says that it represents the Messiah's body without sin and would not decay. And then, it's, it, well, just for me in particular, it's not, it's not clear when, when we are the matzah. How does that fit together? Well, we're to be matzah. In other words, we're to realize we are a new creation. We're a new lump. We're not just uh, the identity of an old sinner saved by grace. We're to be a new lump. Now, obviously, I think every single one of us know we have sinned. But it's not supposed to be a bondage thing. We're to be set free where we can immediately repent and get up and not do the same one over and over. At least make it a different one. So during, during Passover, when I, when I see the matzah there and I'm thinking about the body of Christ, then I'm also thinking about myself as a new creation. That- yeah, right. I think so. I think that we need to. We need to see ourselves as a new creation. Okay, let's stand. I've already gone a minute over. Sorry. So let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for your Torah, for your word. I pray, Lord, we would see the beauty, the joy, the gladness in all of your festivals. And I pray, Lord, you would just put within each one of us a desire to keep the feasts. Give everyone a safe trip home in Yeshua's name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for studying with us today. If you have any questions regarding the material discussed, please contact me at my email address. It's Pastor Mark at El Shaddai Ministries dot U.S. Be blessed and shalom.